Hello everyone and welcome to the first educational lesson. Today we go through general information, trucks, vehicles and simply discuss how the industry works. The first thing to talk about is the participants of the process. There are three parties that are taking part in the process. The first one is our potential customer that has a vehicle to ship or he is still thinking of doing that. We can also call them clients or shippers. The next party is the carrier. Carrier physically possess a truck and ship vehicles. We may also call them carrier companies. It is important to put an accent mark on a letter A so it's a carrier company, not a carrier company. On a regular basis you will call them drivers or carriers. Most carrier companies are small, drivers are mechanic, billing and dispatcher at the same time. Usually those people work for themselves and it makes them a little independent in their deeds. It's important here to build a right connection with them from the beginning of co-working. Be kind, check all the details so you won't have any issues while working with the drivers. And the third party of the process is brokers. We may also call them sales managers or shipping agents. In general, a broker is someone who connects drivers and customers. There are different broker companies, most of them are small. There are about 2000 broker companies on the market. So you need to understand that the market is full and as a result this market is rather competitive. Brokers do not have their own trucks. They find carrier companies that have a truck on some certain route for some certain customer and connect them. Broker gets their commission out of it. As I already guessed, we are one of such companies. Next, I will try to explain you how the industry works. There is a potential customer. Only 30% of customers will end up using our services after receiving a quote. It's not only our conversion rate, but other broker companies too. Here is the reason for that. For instance, there is a person who found a cheap car to buy in California, but he lives in New York. When he received a quote for the transportation, he realized it's too expensive for him and it's cheaper to find a car somewhere locally in New York. Or a person who lives in a city and wants to ship his vehicle to his country house. But when he receives a quote, he understands that it would be cheaper for him to drive it himself or not to do it at all. So let's say that 30% are our potential customers that after receiving a quote would use our services. And the other 70% will never be converted into the order. Okay. Next topic is how the process starts. A customer goes to Google or any other web search and types in ship my car from New York to Florida, for example. And he gets to a website that is called lead generating website. It belongs neither to broker nor to the carrier company. On this website, it is said that he can receive from four up to 10 quotes. Lead generating website is a site that sells leads. Basically, these are websites that spend a lot of money on advertising and are located at the top of each search request. When customer get to those websites, they submit their request for vehicle transportation and then lead generating websites sell those to the broker companies. What's a quote? A quote is an analogy of the word price. You will often hear how much you quoted me, what's your quote, and so on. So the reason we don't call it a price because the total amount is capable of changing. Our customers usually think that the quote is a final price that he or she would need to pay, but they get disappointed in the end because the quoted price is not always the final one. Here's the reason for that. Let's say some certain route costs $500. In about 2-3 months holiday come or quarantine, bad weather, high season or massive protests. So the drivers would request upper payment for instance 200 more making this route cost 700. It's almost impossible to predict such kind of cases. So why does our customer get from 4 to 10 quotes? This is a number of broker companies that a lead is being sold to. 
Basically, that is information about a customer. First and last names, phone number, year, make and model of the vehicle, pickup and delivery zip codes. Zip codes are postal indexes that are attached to some certain area. It lets us understand the approximate location of the vehicle. Such information gathered is called a lead. Ok, let's get back to quotes. When customers sees on website that he's about to receive 4 to 10 quotes, estimated prices. He thinks that he will receive names of companies, their ratings, reviews, choose the cheapest among them and call himself requesting transportation. Here's the second disappointment that comes, because all those 4 to 10 companies start to call, email and send text messages at the same time. Customers are not expecting this at all, so if you want to communicate with a customer well, you need to call him in the first 5 minutes after he submitted his request, after you receive his lead in your CRM system. Otherwise, later he would simply stop answering the phone, he would prefer SMS and try to shop around in order to find the cheapest price. He might also tell you that you called the wrong number, he never requested a quote, so just to get rid of annoying offers. Of course, you can handle such customers even like this. They will call you back themselves after your SMS follow-ups, which is very important. The reason why customers would prefer to work with our company is that our deposits are way lower than deposits of those companies that are based in the USA, because American salaries are way higher than ours. Clients are such people that would care about each 50 bucks because it's a big difference for them when choosing the company. Sometimes they will call you to cancel an order because someone has offered them $20 lower, so you need to prepare for such scenarios. Later on, we will teach you how to deal with such customers. As we mentioned earlier, a broker company doesn't have its own trucks. So, as soon as the customer chooses a company to work with, sign the contract, brokers start to search for the carrier company that will ship vehicles. Nowadays, there are about 9,000 carrier companies. A lot of them are Russian-speaking. You may recognize them by a strong accent. They will be glad to talk to you and offer a discount from time to time. This was a quite long process that our customer go through from the moment they decided to ship their vehicle till they get to the broker companies. Another question. Why can't the customer work directly with the carrier company? There are several reasons. First thing, that is a carrier doesn't have a sales department. Secondly, they would need to have a special license and of course it's almost impossible for some certain carrier company to find a driver that can come to a certain pickup location and deliver to a certain destination point for a specific date. As I already have mentioned before, the driver is usually a person that bought a truck, drives it and maintains it himself. So he doesn't really have enough time for small talks with spoiled customers, it's easier to work through a broker, especially because they do not have pay us. We get our commission out of our customer. That's why carrier companies are always happy to work with brokers. And the next thing we have to discuss is the types of trailers that we use to ship our vehicles. We won't be using word like a car because it defines a certain body type of a vehicle. A car belongs to a sedan. We'll dip into as we move on. Just remember to use word vehicle instead of car. There are three types of trailers that we use to ship vehicles. First one is the most common and is called the car hauler. It's the cheapest, as a result, the most used one. In general, we ship like 98% of our vehicles using car haulers. They can carry from 1 up to 11 vehicles, but it all depends on a car hauler. This is how they look like. There are the double-deckers and the ones that only consist of the one floor. Usually it's a double-decker to be able to carry more vehicles. Car haulers are also divided into open and enclosed trailers. Open one is a truck that you may see in the picture. It doesn't have any coverage and roughly speaking it carries vehicles on the open air. 
The vehicles are parked on these trailers and are subject to some internal damages. Taking bow the flatbeds, they are covered with some tents of fabric that cover vehicles from any sort of damage or weather conditions. The price for enclosed trailer is 50% more expensive than for open ones. For instance, there is some vehicle that is on some certain route and costs 500 for an open trailer. So, it would cost by simple math 750 for an enclosed one. As for the insurance, open car hauler is $100,000 insured, enclosed $250,000. Both cases are 0% deductible. It is also bumper-to-bumper -bumper coverage, meaning that vehicles would be fully insured. Also, enclosed car haulers are divided into soft side and a hard side. The soft side trailers that are covered with any fabric or hard tent that protects our vehicles from the weather conditions, gravel, hail and etc. The hard side is a trailer that is made of plastic or metal. Therefore, the hard side trailer is even more expensive than the soft side one. Enclosed trailers are pretty rare thing. Sometimes it's hard to find driver that has an enclosed truck. So, if your customer is not sure which one to choose, it's better to advise him of an open one, because it's cheaper and easier to find. The only time we would recommend enclosed trailers is when the customer's vehicle is really expensive. Really expensive means more than $100,000. Okay. Another important thing about car haulers is they have special rails that allow driving the vehicle into the car haulers. There is nothing between the rails, meaning it's not a solid platform. So not all kind of the vehicles can be fitted into car hauler. But there is a type of vehicles that is called convertible. It can be soft top or a hard top. Do not mistake it with the soft side and hard side of an enclosed car hauler. Convertible cars can have either a soft top, which means the roof is made of leather or fabric, or it can have a hard top made of plastic or metal. So, if we ship a convertible car on a double deck car hauler, we would ask a driver to place our convertible on a top to prevent any oil or fuel leakage from a car that stays above. Roofs of convertibles are really expensive, and there are not many body shops to fix them. In any case, that will be a negative experience for the customer, even if insurance covers it because it takes time. The driver should provide you a top load service for free, and you can even sell this option to your customer for some additional $50 in order to get some profit on it. Maybe an additional reason for the customer to work with you uh, because he would feel some kind of trust between you and him. Okay, let's move ahead. In case if our vehicle doesn't fit into the car hauler, we use a flatbed. It may fit from one to three vehicles and it has a solid bed, meaning that it doesn't have rails like car haulers do. That's why car hauler has restrictions on the width of the wheelbase. In case a wheelbase is too wide or narrow, won't fit in the rails. That's why we should search for available flatbeds. Shipping vehicles on flatbeds are usually done with a few states. This is not a rule, this is only because flatbed can fit up to three cars, and as a result drivers won't be satisfied with the payment on a long distance. Also, we will use flatbeds or car haulers for inoperable vehicles. Inoperable vehicles cannot drive themselves, meaning they can't get into the truck. Sometimes customers think that their car is inoperable, but you need to double check that all the time. If a customer can drive it for like 20 miles, it doesn't mean that it can drive two in order to be loaded on a truck. It's enough to start the vehicle, drive it into the truck and park it there. It's much cheaper for the customer and much easier to find a driver for an operable car. Also, it's important to know that there are not many flatbeds in the market. Alright, let's assume you check with a customer and his vehicle is indeed inoperable. You need to check these three main criteria that you're able to see on the screen right now. If the vehicle rolls, steers, 
and brakes. Then there are three ways how to get vehicle loaded. The first one, if it does roll, steer and brake, then we can load it using a winch. The winch is equipment that is set up on a cabin of car, hauler or flatbed. The second way is a forklift, which is special equipment that we can find on auction or dealership, some repair shop as well. A forklift is not located on any of the trucks, it's a small separate vehicle itself. Drivers do not have it with them. If you find a way to load a car with a forklift, it's not necessary to have a forklift at a drop-off location, because you may simply put it on a neutral and roll it off the trailer. And the third way is simply human power. If customer ships some chassis or any detail of a vehicle, he can load it himself. It happens indeed very rarely. It's good to know that drivers usually charge extra for inoperable vehicles. But it always depends on the route, body type of the vehicle, though there is no fixed amount of money. Sometimes on popular routes it might be free of charge. This is something you negotiate directly with the driver. Ok, the third type of trailers that we use shipping vehicles is a low boy. It is used for shipping heavy or oversized vehicles such as boats, recreational vehicles, travel trailers and so on. It's usually very expensive and you won't work with them often. I would even say that you would never face such type of a truck. It has height restriction, so you would need to request dimensions from the customer. Next thing to go through is the body type of the vehicles. The first and the most common body type is a sedan. When we say sedan, we mean car. A regular car with four doors, medium-sized trunk. Also, coupe, convertible and hatchbacks are considered to be a sedan. There are three sizes of a sedan – small, medium and large. The size of the vehicle impacts the price for shipping. For example, Mini Cooper and Lexus LS60 are sedans, but Mini Cooper is a small one, Lexus is a large one. It means that drivers would usually request additional payment for a larger vehicle. Next body type is SUV or Sport Utility Vehicle. There are small, medium and large SUVs. Basically, it's any vehicle that you would call a Jeep. To understand the difference, I'm going to show you some examples on screen. There is a such car called Suzuki Jimny and it belongs to SUV Small. Another very popular vehicle brand in the US is Jeep. Almost all of them are mid-sized. Here is one of them, Jeep Grand Cherokee. If we talk about SUVs large, here is an example of Cadillac Escalade. It has an extended trunk and usually has seven seats. Yes, it only has four doors, but it has two additional seats at back. Next body type is a pickup truck. It's a very popular vehicle in the United States because you can use it as a family car, also for transportation of some equipment or goods. Very useful vehicle indeed. There are some small pickup trucks, crew cabs, extended cab, full size and dually. How to define an exact body type? All pickup weighs two doors are small pickups. Four doors pickup trucks are crew cabs. The extended cab is a pickup truck that has an extended cabin or extended bed. It is usually indicated in the name of the vehicle and you can also visually find differences. Another type of pickup truck is full size. You'll be able to define them by their names. It usually indicated that it's either 350 or 3500. All American pickup trucks producers use the same indexes. If it's Ford, it would be 150, 250, 350. The rest, such as GMC, Chevy, use 1500, 2500, 3500 and so on. It means that these pickup trucks are produced to transport heavy equipment. These pickup trucks are heavy themselves and would cost more than sedans or SUVs. 
Next type of pickup truck is dually. They have double wheels at the back, created in order to carry even more heavy equipment. Here is how all of them look like. Chevy Silverado is a pickup small, just has two doors and a bed. Toyota Tacoma, a four-door pickup truck with a regular cabin and a bed. It's called a crew cab. Dodge Ram 1500 extended cab. This is something in between with the crew cab and small sized one because we only have two doors and an extended bed. It does have four seats, but in order to get there, the driver will need to get passengers go through the front doors. Dent Ford F350. To distinguish the difference between the Ford F150 and F350 is not easy, so simply pay attention to the name of the vehicle. If it's Ford F150, for Dodge Ram it would be 1500 and will belong to the full size pickup. Next is Dually. Is same size as a full size, but he has double wheels at the back in order to carry more heavy equipment. Okay, I hope everything's clear with our pickups and we can move ahead to the next body type. Alright, here we have Van. There is three types of vans, mini van, van full size and van with extended length. They have different sizes and different numbers of passengers that may fit inside. A mini van can fit up to 7 passengers, full size up to 13 passengers, extended length uh, 20 people. Let's take a look at the pictures. The most popular mi minivan is Toyota Sienna. You've probably seen many of those in different movies. Usually mothers take their children to school on such minivans. The minivan itself reminds of an SUV, but SUV is a lifted body type. The minivan is not and has a long body, also the back door slides. As an example of a van full size, let's take a look at Chevy Express. The reason I show you the pictures is for you to understand which body type of vehicle has your specific lead, your customer, this will help you to set up a quote for the shipment. And as an example of one with extended length, here is a Dodge Sprinter, he has about 20 seats. We can move ahead to the next body type which is motorcycle. There are just two types of motorcycle, just a regular one and trike. The regular motorcycles has two wheels, the trike has three. Here is how we quote such a motorcycle. You may write it down because you will need this information later as you start working. Regular motorcycle at the open truck will cost 20% less than shipping a sedan, a car I mean. As for the trikes, it's always quoted as a sedan, it won't really differ at price. Okay. Hope that's clear and we move ahead to recreational vehicles. They are different in their size, that's why it's hard to calculate the quote, the price, but let's better discuss how to ship them at all. There are three ways. Drive away, tow away and haul. Drive away is when the driver comes and drives the RV to the destination point. But in this case, RV has to be operable, has to have all the plates, documents and insurance. Tow away is when a driver comes on his truck and tows the RV with him. The hole is something we are familiar with. A driver comes on a low boy or flatbed and loads the RV on the trailers, then ship it. Travel trailers are the same thing, but they do not have an option to drive away. There is only tow away or haul, because a travel trailer is just like a wagon that is attached to a vehicle. It doesn't have an engine, unlike RV. Also, you will face all kinds of ATVs, UTVs, golf cars, buggy and so on. They are quoted as a sedan, even though they are a little smaller, lighter, but Drivers usually have too much headache with them, because they have small wheels, it's hard to fix them on the trailers, so drivers usually request the same price as for a sedan. Ok, the next general topic that we will discuss right now is our customers. 
Mostly, auctions belong to the category of online buyers. There are three main auctions in the United States. Cobalt, Insurance Auto Auction, Incorporated, or IAAI, and Mannheim. Cobalt and IAAI mostly sell damaged cars. It doesn't mean that they are inoperable, they might just have a scratch or some huge damage even. Cobalt and Insurance Auto Auction are insurance auctions that the car goes to after some accident, so the insurance company tries to sell those cars. Mannheim mostly sells good vehicles or vehicles with minor damage. Auctions have restricted working hours, it depends where the auction is. Copart and IAAI are usually open on weekdays, 8 a.m. till 5 p.m. Also, they do not operate on holidays. As for Mannheim, the office is usually open from 9 a.m. till 5 p.m., but the yard where they keep the vehicles might be open 24 per 7. Once again, it all depends on which city the auction is at. If you know that your customer is shipping the vehicle from or from or to an auction, it's always good to check their working hours and coordinate with the drivers. Now, documents that are needed to release a vehicle from any of these auctions. Buyer number. Buyer number is a number given to a customer when he or she registers on an auction. Lot number. This is basically a number of a vehicle at the auction. Win code is a code that belongs to a car when it gets produced. It contains letter and numbers. Win code also contains specific information about a specific vehicle and it always indicated in documents for the vehicle. As for Mannheim, we would also need a gate pass, which is a document that your customer will send you and you will pass it to the driver. He will need to show it on the gate in order to get the vehicle picked up. Another thing that you may face while working with auctions is a storage fee. If a customer buys a vehicle at some auction, but for some reason doesn't show up on time in the nearest 5 to 7 days to pick it up, then a storage fee would be applied. It means that an additional $10-$20 should be paid to the auction for each day of storage if the vehicle doesn't get picked up within some period of time. An advantage of auction is that usually have forklift, so driver can pick up inoperable cars easily. Now we are moving ahead to the next group of customers, which is a dealership. Either dealership will contact you to request your services or people who buy vehicles at the dealerships. The difference between the auctions and dealerships is that dealerships usually has extended working hours, but once again, you will need to check them with a specific dealership. Also, sometimes they work on Saturdays. Documents needed for the dealerships are following. Stock number, win code and release form. Sometimes some dealerships will require a release form, but it happens very rarely. The stock number is like a lot number at the auction, the number of a vehicle. And the next group is individual customers. Those are the people that ship either buy vehicle or moving somewhere. Some of them move to college to study, some due to work. Usually, when you deal with individuals, drivers would often ask you if a vehicle goes from a private residence or business location, because they want to know if a place has limited working hours or not. Drivers prefer to work with individuals because there are no queues, no lines, no need to wait in order to get a vehicle. Also, most auctions or dealership pay with a company check but individuals with cash which is more preferable to drivers. Individuals do not have time restriction. They can negotiate with their customer what's time suit them the most. But for you as a broker, would be preferable to work with the dealerships. Because if you find a dealer that is interested to ship loads with you, you'll receive a lot of business from them, meaning a lot of orders. They can give you 10, 20 vehicles per month when customers usually move one, two times a year. 
As for the documents, individuals do not require any type of documents. All you would need is a car key and the vehicle itself. We will also request a phone number of the people at the pickup and delivery locations, so we can call them when it's time to pick up or drop off the vehicle. No paperwork is needed. Alright, next topic that we have to discuss is something called Snowbird Clients. Snowbird Clients are seasonal customers. Those people who ship their vehicles according to the weather, their college, work or their country house. For example, there are customers that live in the New York area and when it goes too cold in winter, they move to Florida to their county house, for instance. They do not want to drive their vehicles, so they simply use our services and book flight to Florida, or vice versa. When it's too hot in Florida, they move to the New York area. It's not necessarily these two states, this is the most popular route of Snowbird clients. Also, there is such a route as California, Texas and vice versa. Here are main centers of car shipping in the US. In Texas, it would be Houston, Dallas, San Antonio and Austin. In California, this is Los Angeles. Florida itself is uh, popular for shipping vehicles, mostly the peninsula. This part right here is not considered to be a good area for shipping vehicles because not many drivers go through this particular place. When you ship a vehicle on a popular route, prices may be so different. For example, if you ship a vehicle from Florida to New York for $900 and same day from New York to Florida, it might cost you $300. The man created price, the more vehicles to ship, the higher price is. In order for the driver to get back to Florida, he takes all the vehicles on his way for a cheap price. When it's a high season, the price may be something in between for both directions, around 600. Ok, while we have the map opened, let's discuss a transit time. How long does it take to deliver a vehicle? It's a really often question that it will be asked by your customer. If it's coast to coast, it would take 7 to 10 days. North to south, or vice versa, usually takes 4 to 5 days. The easiest way to tell the customer the exact transit time is to divide the number of miles of the route by 400. Why? Because drivers usually cover up to 400 miles a day, so for instance, for the route of 1200 miles, it would take 3 days. Also, you need to understand such a thing as a good route. It depends on how fast and which price you get a driver for. The route is popular when a vehicle is going from a big city, like a center, to a big city. For example, Denver, Colorado to Atlanta, Georgia. A city doesn't necessarily have to be huge, but if they are located by a highway when the trucks drive, then the price would be alright. Another case is when you have a driver that goes for instance from Los Angeles to New York and requests for 900, but the same driver might get request for 800 for some county town to the same destination in New York. And the reason for that is because he would need to go off the highway, go look for the town and load the car. That would be a little problematic and that's why such route would be considered as unpopular. As I mentioned before, the popularity of route creates the price. Basically, that was it. Please note that our CRM system uses short names of the United States. So, if it's important to learn these shortenings along with the whole information from this recording. Here they are on your screen right now. You can see all the states and their shortening names. Hope this lecture was as clear as possible. Please watch it a couple of times and if you have any questions, feel free to contact your supervisor that is in charge of your education process. Good luck!